that's what's coming next. That will be the rubber layer right now. So you're also going to notice that in every cigar. started in the 1500s bringing West Africans over and uh, enslaving them. The dark lines on this are the, the fleets that brought the West Africans over and the countries they enslaved, that they uh, were enslaved in, and what went back to the Europe, European countries was sugar, tobacco, and rum. Uh, the, as I said before, the 1492, when Spain claimed Cuba as a colony, there were at least 600,000 indigenous people. Nine out of ten of them were the Tainos. By 1550, there were 3,000 left, 
And these folks were killed, they committed suicide, they ran away, and uh, they were tortured. And many of them married, became wives of the Spanish. Slavery was abolished in 1886, so 300 years of slavery uh, took place on Cuba. In the 1900s, another group came over from Haiti. They were African and uh, French, French Africans, and from Jamaica, and they came to work on the coffee and the sugar plantations. And the quote was, there were tens of thousands of these uh, Afro-Haitians. So the people of Cuba, they, Cheryl and I had a difficult time with the census, how they're setting that up. On the census in Cuba today, you get a choice of white, black, matizo, that's the indigenous and the Spanish put together, and Asian. And so the census says there's over 60% white in Cuba. That, that, is, that is so wrong. There is not 60% white in Cuba. Uh, these are our little guys that we met. Can you see? Is, yeah. I want to show you there. Yeah, here's the one. Here are the differences in skin tone, features, etc., on these four little guys that um, flirted with me. <laughs> they were supposed to be in their little, in their little uh, line going in, and they just thought we were the neatest people in the world. And so uh, the tones of skin tone is amazing in uh, Cuba, and, and so much of it is mixed race. The wars for domination over Cuba began way back in the 1500s when the indigenous people tried to revolt. They revolted over and over again, but Spain kept them um, controlled. And 200 years later, the British tried um, colonizing Cuba, and it went on for seven years, and again, Spain took up, kept it up. It was at the late 1860s that much of the, uh, the first war of independence happened, and the Cuban people finally got uh, the war, um, got independence in 1895, and it was that poet that um, was one of the revolutionaries that got killed in the first battle. So, the United States, had, who had been in Cuba the whole, from the early, late 1700s, fought with the Cubans, and it was called the Spanish-American War, but it really was the Spanish-American-Cuban War. And uh, U.S. said in 1902 allowed Cuba to be independent. And um, Cheryl will go on about that in Guantanamo and, and their control, the U.S. control. But just assume that from the 1900s to 1950. The United States had a great hold over Cuba, and their president in the 40s, Batista. The Spanish and the Cuban War begins, whoops, begins, I can't go back. Here we go. Uh, with the sinking of the main. The U.S. called themselves a protectorate for Cuba after they defeated the Spanish at the Battle of San Juan Hill. Their, from the Cubans' point of view, their father of the homeland was Cespedes. Cespedes. I probably can't say that right. I'm sorry. Um, 
another horrible film thing, sorry. Okay, Batista, he was, was elected the ninth president of Cuba and the 12th. He suspended the 1940 constitution and he aligned with the rich sugar kings. From the time he was in to the revolution, he was, his United States had his foot on Batista's neck. In came the Mafia, uh, encouraged by the United States. In came drugs, prostitution, gambling. The casinos came in, and there was, the divide, which has always been there between the rich and the poor, became even greater. What was um, the fight for? It was fight for sugar and rum. It was fight for the sugar cane, the tobacco, and this is our Clara. We had a, a meeting with Clara in the um, tobacco where uh, Cheryl bought cigars. Uh, <laughs> to the store, and Clara, for 40 years, has hand-rolled tobacco, uh, cigars. And we had, she gave us a demonstration of what she did. 40 years, she was in her late 60s and started in her 20s, rolling. We were there about, I got almost seven minutes, seven, eight minutes, one cigar was rolled. Here's our guys, you see, <laughs> out on the street, loving their cigars. Here's the folks, um, we had air-conditioned buses all the time, 14 of us plus our guides, up and down the highways of Cuba at the various memorials, museums, and artisans, and learning about the culture. Guess what all those are along the bit? The road. Rice. rice. It's rice that had just been picked. And do you know what they do with it? <clears throat> Put it on the highway to dry. Labor intensive. And it's out there on the highway. And on the right hand side, you can see those trucks going this way. They just go out in the middle of the road and go around the long miles of rice as it dries. So, each time I ate rice and beans, I looked through it for like roadkill or something. <laughs> there was never any. It was delicious. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got into Bautista, into why the, why they are, why the U.S. wants total control over Cuba for its rum, sugar, rice, and tobacco, and the casinos began, and um, uh, the mafia was in town. The cabarets are still going, and we went to one, this is from now, it's from May. We went into the cabarets, it was amazing music, amazing music. At those same times in those 40s, 50s, who was there but Ernest? Ernest's farm was about nine miles from Havana, and this is his chair and his desk where he wrote, uh, not the bell, for whom the bell, um, which one did he write there? Oh, yeah. There? Yeah. And the home, what was the other one? Name and yeah. yeah. What is that? Oh, oh, man. Man. No, he didn't want to go there. Farewell to arms. Thank you. He wrote the sound of his day. No. <laughs> and he came into town all the time. He was with his third or fourth wife. They bought this farm and did the whole, we did the whole thing. And you don't go into the farm, into the house. You go around the open windows on the outside. You cannot go in. And it is beautiful. You see the cats. You can see the cats. You can see the flowers. There is pool. 
and his boat. They dragged his boat out to the farm in case you wanted to see that. The monster Mayor Lansky built the famous Havana Riviera right on the water, and it still stands today. Lucky Luciano came, and um, this is the best photo I could get of him. <laughs> he, uh, he, he had total control over the gambling, and <coughs> so the divide was huge. This is the hotel where we stayed, the Nacional, and it was, that doesn't look like that now. And the gambling was going on there, and the cars were coming in. And during the 40s and the 50s, all the, all the cars came in from the United States, and they are still there today. And uh, we got in, we, we, I did not drive this. <laughs> but they took us around in the cars. And there we are. <laughs> and there's hundreds and hundreds of these cars, fully painted, fully upholstered, and they get none of the they get none of the parts. They out of wire and whatever they can find, they have these cars running in in uh, Cuba today. Two things before I hand it over to. Um, Cheryl, one, I want to tell you a little bit about the music of Cuba. Song is the birth of all other Cuban music. It comes from the 1800 Spanish and African verse, song and drumming. Salsa derives from song, but influenced by many other genres, including American jazz. Rumba, a catchword for various forms of Afro-Cuban song and dance, bolero, which was a very romantic, heartfelt, more of a ballad. Jazz was extremely, is still extremely popular throughout the island, and the jazz musicians are world famous. We went to um, jazz club at least twice. Yeah, woo, they were great. Nueve Trova is the politicized genre since the revolution is folksy and it's emotionally charged. Timba is the most dominant sound in Cuba today, and it draw, draws on African folk and rumba. We went to, every day there was music at the restaurants, in the plazas, uh, there would be drumming, there would be cello, there would be singing, violins. We went to an amazing guitar concert that they did just for us in Santa Clara, and um, and met the musicians. Religion. Santa Maria is the, well, Cuba is an atheist state since the 50s. But it, uh, religion is, it, um, you can practice religion. Catholics, Protestants, Jews, <coughs> Jews, they're all practicing, but the most, 80% um, of Cubans practice some form of Santeria. I had not heard that thing, and then I opened it up and read it. She had heard this from our guide, and I did not know, I did not hear it from about Santeria, but I read about it, and it is not in a church form, it's in the home, or it's in the public, uh, public squares. Lots of drumming, spitting, lots of rum, spitting out guitar, stuff, and the ceremony goes on for hours. There's Catholicism, and the beautiful Spanish churches are everywhere. And uh, we got to look into, we got to go look into hundreds of them. Gender. Women's role is to cook, clean, child care, and care for the elderly, and be feminine. After the revolution, and the men, the role of machismo. Since the revolution, there is free child care, abortion is free, there's free maternity and post-maternity care, there's education for all, and there's equal pay for men and women. However, the women go to are the majority of the parliament, they're the majority of the government, and local and state, and they have to come home, 
and do the chores, take care of the children and the elderly. Elderly do not go to um, nursing homes, they stay in the home. And it's the women who take care of the elderly. The men are starting to share some of the house chores. There are eight, since the beginning in 1869, there have been eight Cuban constitutions. We have one. They have eight. They have had eight. And the latest one was voted for 2019, and it's radical, and the, the Cubans are very hopeful about this one. They read it, they understand it, and they're really excited about this. The revolution begins with Cheryl Smith. Now, <coughs> yeah, I'm not touching anything. <coughs> Cheryl. 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 What we learned. Okay. Hey, Joe, that guitar is about to fall. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks. Okay. It's just a Very well. Okay. And we'll have we'll have the questions after we'll, because we're really doing this right here to live on our time right here. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, um, we're gonna go forward from where uh, John left off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is uh, one of the port oldest ports in Cuba, where they defended. Uh, there was a fort there where they defended their island. As you can see from this, you can see that incredible. View uh, city of Havana. It's just absolutely an incredibly beautiful island. I have from uh, all of the accounts I've ever read about Cuba have always seen it as being a, a very isolated place and a place that was pretty much bleak and disturbed. Oh yeah, great. This is pretty disturbing. Okay. Oh, sorry. Hi! Hey. Hey. as you read about Cuba in our history books and in the, what you hear in the news that it's pretty, uh, a pretty sad place where people are oppressed and, and uh, restricted and it was just an incredibly beautiful island with amazingly wonderful people who seemed incredibly welcoming and free. It was really wonderful to be there. So going back to where Joan left off on the, the topic of uh, the uh, Spanish American Cuban War. Uh, Cubans are very, very um, clear that the war was between them and Spain. America stepped in to protect American interests, not to support the Cuban people. At that point in time, the majority of the industry there was the profits were being shared primarily with America and Spain. So uh, the Cuban people want you to know it was a Cuban war and that uh, even though they won, they were not allowed to get this wealth of their victory at that time because the United States, in order for it to withdraw its troops from Cuba, demanded this Platt Agreement. The Platt Agreement was uh, an agreement that said that the United States had the right to intervene in Cuba, Cuban affairs, at any time. At the time, they said it would just be intervention in support of uh, American holdings in the, in the island. But within two years, that interference would move to another level because within two years, Guantanamo Bay was uh, placed on the island um, the perpetual lease of an unwelcome presence. The people of Cuba do not benefit from Guantanamo Bay. They get nothing from there. There was an agreement that in 1903 that they would have a yearly cost that the United States would pay to Cuba. The very first payment was made under Batista. After the revolution, the revolutionary government refused to take a dime from America and asked the Americans to leave, which they said because they had taken one payment, it was a legitimate agreement and it could not be altered or broken 
and thus we have Guantanamo Bay in Cuba today. And apparently it's going to be that way for the time being. Uh, <clears throat> the people of Cuba, as I said, did not benefit the agreement. Got nothing. And uh, July 26, 1953, Fidel Castro a letter of a regime to overthrow Santiago to Cuba, which was an American army barracks. He had garnered uh, um, a group of men, which uh, the Cuban folklore says that he, he took over Cuba with 11 men. Well, that wasn't exactly true. He had a few more than 11. But Fidel was a master artist, and he was an incredibly persuasive person. And a little bit about Fidel's background, he really came from a very uh, a well-to-do family. He was a graduate from college. He had a, a degree as an attorney, although uh, according to what I've read, he wasn't that successful as an attorney. But he had a very persuasive manner about himself, and, and he was able to pretty much uh, get people to agree with him on most things. So he got these guys together. They're going to overthrow this Batista regime, which is becoming increasingly increasingly um, oppressive on the people, and there's lots and lots of uh, uh, violence against the working class people at this time. So Fidel has this uh, group together. They uh, try to take over the army barracks. They were unsuccessful in doing so. So Fidel and his brother Raul were two of the prisoners that went to jail after this uh, uprising that was unsuccessful. And it was while they were in jail that Raul met Ernesto Che Guevara. That's how they came in contact and introduced him to Fidel. One of the interesting pieces of information that I got from the readings that I did, uh, the uh, programs that I watched, is that Fidel was never a committed communist. Raul and Che were both committed communists. Fidel was not. So it's interesting how most of the information that you get about Fidel can always say anti-US. And he wasn't. He wasn't anti-U.S., he was pro-Cuba. But he wasn't a, a communist at that point. Uh, she joined Castro's regime and was a major leader in the revolution. The revolution was successful. Batista left um, the country with most of the spoils um, after uh, they took over. There was what I call the winding road to the embargo in the Bay of Pigs. This is the this is the uh, Guevara Memorial that you are at right here. It was an incredibly beautiful place, and lots and lots of pictures. This is really really a nice tribute to him. There is a perpetual flame burning there, and it's kind of a reference place, and they're very very protective of the uh, artifacts in there. So you're careful about where you go and what you can do in there. The uh, end of the ruthless dictatorship of Batista. Batista fell. And, and he did not fall in battle. He fled the country with $350 million. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, landed aristocracy and all those that were benefiting from the mafia's rule, they also fled. Where'd they go? Here, Florida. Yeah, that's where they are. So obviously the story that they tell about Fidel and Cuba is a little bit different from what the Cuban people tell us today. Um, but anyway, after that, um, but, uh, Batista had imprisoned and executed many citizens before he left Cuba. And he was fully supported by the U.S. government. There was a quote by, I think it was Nixon or Eisenhower, I can't remember which one. Yes, he is a terrible person, but he's our terrible person, so if you're going to support him. Uh, Fidel took power on January 3rd, 1959. His first act, as far as reaching out to foreign uh, countries, was to come to the United States of America. And he asked for a meeting with uh, Eisenhower. Well, they sent uh, him to Nixon, uh, asked for support. Nixon turned him down. President Eisenhower went to Georgia to play golf. And he wrote a very, very negative, uh, scathing assessment of Fidel Castro, saying that he was very, very dangerous to the democracy in, in the, the uh, hemisphere. 
So Castro eventually, while he was here in the United States in 1959, and this is my first introduction to Fidel Castro, so I'll say personally, this is when I started to fall in love with Fidel Castro. Because he came to Harlem, and he met with Malcolm X, and in my lifetime, there had never been a world leader who came to Harlem. There had never been a world leader that championed the civil rights struggle of blacks in America. So I was like, really into Fidel. I thought he was a good person. However, that's not the way it was portrayed, and that's not what happened. Uh, Eisenhower severed all diplomatic relations with Cuba, and the newly elected President John Kennedy inherits the Cuban problem, including the fledgling plan for an invasion to, takes over the island, to take over the island. So we know that uh, shortly following that, the Bay of Pigs invasion took place. And it was April 17, 1961, attempt to overthrow Castro. They sent the CIA back guerrilla invasion force. Uh, it was not successful. The invasion force lands in a huge swamp. We went to the Bay of Pigs. And what was interesting is the guy's like, I don't know who planned this operation, but this is the biggest swamp on the continent. You know, and they sent the, the people in there to overthrow the Cubans. They, they saw them coming, you know, because there was nothing but swamp land around here. Uh, and so they, at the time when they landed, the Americans were, uh, had, had uh, shot down several planes, but they were all civilian planes. They weren't military planes. And, one of those planes is sitting in front of the Bay of Pigs Museum today. You can see it there. Uh, the interesting thing that came out of this invasion, besides the fact that the Cubans thwarted the attempt, is that at one point, Castro was notified of what was going on. He went. He went to the front lines, and he became the visible hero of the Bay of Pigs invasion. And as I said, he's a masterful uh, politician. So you see Fidel, you know, he is like uh, Iron Man or the Amazing Hulk or somebody. He's up there, you know, and the people, people, all of those who were on the fence or lukewarm, they became so in hand entranced with him because they saw him as the hero of the country who was willing to put his life on the line for the Cuban people. So that kind of turned the tide for Fidel, which is not exactly what they had in mind, but that's what happened. So out of that, came what our guy said was heroes and legends. And the hero, of course, was Fidel Castro. Shortly after that, in 1967, Che Guevara was killed as he was trying to uh, head, start up a new uh, revolutionary movement. And uh, he was separated from uh, the Cuban movement at that point. Prior to that, he was instrumental in the Cuban uh, new government of Cuba and did a lot to enhance the country. But then uh, he wanted to continue the revolution. He went to Congo, he went to Bolivia, he went to different places trying to, to, to recreate what happened in Cuba. And eventually he was captured and assassinated. And uh, again, Fidel, being the brilliant man that he was, he <coughs> recognized the people's love for shame. So Che became the face of the revolution. So everywhere you go to Cuba, Che is everywhere. He's the only non-Cuban that has a bus in one of the squares in the major cities in Cuba. You know, and people love Che. You know, he was Argentina. He's not Cuban. Uh, so going forward, President Kennedy, in response to the loss of the Bay of Pigs, expanded the existing Cuban embargo to include all Cuban trade. One month later, the Soviet Union attempted to install ballistic missiles in Cuba. And then the blockade started, as you guys probably remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Stalemate it ending with a compromise, removing American missiles from Turkey and so uh, from uh, Turkey, and I put Soviet missiles from Turkey, mis misspoke. Soviet missiles from Cuba. That was a compromise they made. However, this blockade really put a hardship on Cuba. <coughs> so Cuba's main uh, export at that time was sugar, and the Soviet Union bought the majority, almost all of Cuban sugar. And at the time, in order to support Cuba, 
They paid four times the market value of this cane sugar at the time. So the, the Aryan island of Cuba was pretty much dependent on Soviet money, you know, and they, that was their primary source of resources to continue to have their factories running. Uh, <clears throat> so they managed to survive the embargo, and as I said, they produced sugar. The Soviet Union was their primary customer, and four times the market value. <clears throat> And this went on for a long period of time. There have been several attempts, I think they said like maybe 15 attempts on Castro's life during this time and he managed to survive them all. Uh, the U.S. of course did not have any in, in interest in that, but that's what happened. And finally, in, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Cuba's economic future stood on the brink. Cuba lost 75% of its imports and exports. So Cuba was in dire, very, very dire straits at that time, and the Cuban people were suffering immensely. So this is called the special period in Cuba, which is sort of like a euphemism for the fact that this is a specially difficult period in Cuba. And due to the lack of petroleum and general imports and severe food shortages. Most of the industry in Cuba at this time ceases. Cuba is scrambling just to feed its people and keep the, keep the economy and keep the government going. They have no support from anywhere else after the Soviet Union collapsed. It became a rogue democratic state of sorts. So they were not supporting Cuba. They did not have favored nation status with the Soviets anymore. So, uh, in order to continue, they had to find another source of support. Well, that was Venezuela. So Cuba and Venezuela had had relations since 1902. However, there was a split in that Cuba supported, uh, uh, in the, the uh, <coughs> crisis with the Soviet Union, uh, Venezuela supported the United States at that time, and of course Cuba was supporting the Soviets. So there was a little bit of an estranged relationship then. Uh, but in 1999, the relationship significantly improved when Hugo Chavez became the president of Venezuela and formed a very, very close alliance with uh, Fidel Castro. The alliance was multifaceted in that he considered, uh, Ch uh, Chavez considered Fidel to be his mentor and called Cuba a revolutionary democracy. So he was very close to the Cuban dictator, the Cuban, Cuban people. The trade, the bilateral trade relations uh, that they developed at that time, or joint business ventures, large financial transactions, exchange of energy resources, information technology. One of the most prominent uh, resources as far as export is concerned in Cuba today is their medical facility, their medical staff, their medical expertise. So there are over 20,000 Cuban doctors in Venezuela at this time. And uh, they, they are all over the world. And the Cuban medicine is considered to be state of the art. And many people seek them, seek them out for their expertise and information. The interesting thing about that is that uh, the uh, bedrock of their medical system is holistic medicine. And it works extremely well, and people do seek them out to get that information. But they also have allopathic medication also. One of the things that Joan and I witnessed that was so uh, contrary to what you might see in America is we were out too late at night hanging out with the Cubans. <laughs> we could walk the streets all night. Cuba is an incredibly safe country, amazingly safe. So we're out there hanging out, and we walked by a pharmacy the pharmacy's open, it's like 11.30 at night. There's one girl in there dispensing medicine, and there's a lot of people getting their prescriptions filled. There's no guards, there's no locks, there's no doors, none of that. Because crime is hardly seen in Cuba. Cuba has a very low crime rate and no drug problem. And that's something you won't ever hear, probably in the news, but Cuba has no drug problem. And one of the things that the Cubans said is that they would like to have an uh, open economy. They would like to see their economy change so that they can become more prosperous as individuals and as companies. One thing they do not want to import, import 
from America is the drugs. You know, the other countries where America is prominent, the drug cartels seem to be running the country. The Cubans are very, very much aware that they do not want that to be a part of their country at this time. But they do want change, and they are very forward-looking, which I think is, is really uh, encouraging. So the changing face of the Caribbean is that these countries that are emerging, they want to be independent. They want to have their own form of government. They do not want to model American democracy, but neither do they want to continue under socialism or uh, I will say communism more than socialism. What they're interested in is a democratic socialist state where they can have free markets and free trade and be successful economically and maintain their commitment to the, to the needs of the people. They don't want to give up uh, universal education or universal health care or free places for people to live. That part they want to keep. So the question becomes, how do they maintain what they want and move forward with the things that they're trying to change? Uh, one of the things that they say about the embargo is that it has forced the Cuban people to become extraordinarily creative and inventive. So Joan shows you guys a picture of a car. I just want to say that car and I were born the same year, 1948. <laughs> <laughs> we're still beautiful. But <laughs> so, what I want to say is that that is part of the Cuban ingenuity to allow them to be able to maintain those cars in pristine condition after all these years. And lots of other things they've had to be inventive because they don't get imports, they don't get parts, they don't get new things. Uh, and one of the things that we were impressed with also is this thing that they call the Cuban packet. These are young men on their cell phones. Cell phones are huge in Cuba, and cell phones are not new. And when I say they're not new, they don't have new cell phones. But they have young people in the, in the country who specialize in communications or experts at taking any cell phone and turning it into a very well-functioning, up-to-date cell phone. And they have this thing that our, our, our guy told us was the Cuban packet. Somehow, they managed not only to get cell phones, but they can get communication through any source, whether it's the movies or television or HBO or Netflix or whatever, and uh, even the fire stick. They have the ability to bring all of that into Cuba. So, um, they have um, a Cuban packet where they, you can buy the, the equipment and you can see the latest. And as he pointed out, we have no copyright agreement with America. So they can show anything in Cuba that they choose. So that's pretty much, um, I feel, that's the spirit of Cuba. That they are very energetic, they're very forward looking, they're very excited about their future. And they acknowledge the deficits of the, of the situation that they're in right now. And probably the, the most basic is that they don't have the ability to advance financially. You know, and that is a big one. Even though the basic needs are met, they want to be more creative and more successful. Uh, the new constitution, as Joan as was saying, has been written. Uh, this constitution was written on, was ratified on February 24, 2018. 90 percent, 91 percent of people voted in favor of the new constitution. And on April 20th, Miguel Diaz Canal was named as the new Cuban leader for the first time in six decades. Someone not named Castro will be the leadership of Cuba. And uh, people are excited about this. And one of the, two of the things in the new constitution that we were made aware of that I think is exciting. There's what they're saying, what amounts to affirmative action for women in Cuba. They want the women to be more and more involved in the, in the running of the country, in the heads of the country. So they have that in there. And they also have an LGBTQIA platform in there to expand the, uh, the rights and privileges of people who are gay. They even have uh, free zones, LBGT free zones, where there is uh, the opportunity for people who are gay not only to have businesses, but also to express themselves in whatever way they choose. So I think that's a real hopeful thing. We were very disappointed when we heard that the uh, uh, cruises were being turned around and that maybe we would, other people wouldn't be able to go. 
But I'm hoping that's just temporary, short-lived, and that all of you will have the opportunity to have the extraordinary experience we did. We didn't hear anything about AIDS, to be honest. And why can't Cuba, why can't Americans go to Cuba? In my opinion, or you want some facts? Actually, <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the administration's uh, but, what position is so right now. So you're saying it's the American oh, government that oh yes support. oh the Cuban no. people are wide open welcome to Americans. They love the American people, and they will tell you that right off the bat. We love American people. It's the government we have a problem with. And they'll say that right now. And they love it. And they want Americans to come in and experience their country. They really do. I thought under Obama that there was restrictions were not as tough. They were under Obama. Is that correct? Yes. You are Rock and Michelle went to Cuba and yes. took that place by storm. The people loved him. He got on a um, stand-up comedian show and did a whole thing with one of the cute, most famous Cuban uh, comedians on the United States and our policies. <laughs> they thought he was cool. He walked along the streets, he ate with them, and he lifted a lot of, he began lifting the visitations and the reasons uh, the seven reasons how you could get to Cuba um, in, in his term, in his two terms. Trump is shutting it down. I'd like to ask about health care, uh, particularly about abortions that are available. Does that mean, how does that work out with, uh, with Catholicism? Okay. What about pain for these, you know? Um, abortion is legal. Anyone can have an abortion. They can have one more than one. They can have all they want. They, it has nothing to do with Catholicism. The state is an atheist state. You can you can be a Catholic, and I'm sure the Pope cringes at abortion. And in the church, they would say it's against the law. But the Cuban people the Cuban women will continue to have it legal no matter what. And how about health care? Is that uh, affordable? Universal. Abortions are affordable. It's free. It's free. Free. It's free. Other health care is free. Yes. yes. Cuba has yes. universal health care. Yeah. You go into a pharmacy, you go into a doctor's office, you pay nothing. Huh. Yay! Coming up here. I just want to ask if there was a language barrier. No, I have terrible Spanish. I have uh, probably two or three uh, lessons in Spanish, and we spoke English the whole time. Our guide was um, a high school teacher before he joined the tourist trade. And he's a uh, he's from Havana. He uh, he would interpret when we needed it. Okay. <laughs> 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 
uh, jail people and give counseling and rehabilitation for bad words. Right. And one of the deterrents to, to domestic violence is that when, a, when a person marries, if they can't afford their own place and they have to move in with family, it has to be her family. Oh. <laughs> so her brothers, her brothers and her, her daddy. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Jerry. You know, uh, currently the uh, like Chiquita Banana and Bacardi and American Sugar are the primary movers behind the Florida. Uh, you know, the blockage. They want to take over Cuba. Oh yeah. <laughs> they want their good old days back. <laughs> And we don't Not recognize that out. in this country very much. We don't know who's running that movement. And currently they they hold a big hammer in the Republican Party. Yes, they do. Yeah. Thank you. Lee. I have heard that uh, Germany and Sweden didn't really care a fig for what American policies were, and they were all right with building hotels uh, on the Havana Riviera Central. And trying to get in their import cars. Yes. 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 We were not on the uh, resort side. They're, they they talked about the pristine beaches and the beautiful hotels and how people come there and, and, and book a hotel for months and just hang out on the on the beaches there. But we weren't on that side. We were with the people. We were with the people. <laughs> we were in the streets, <coughs> in the alleyways. He went to a couple of homes that were incredible, where they had their business in their home, and the home, the place where they lived was just beautiful. Yeah. And we went to some of the most beautiful restaurants you've ever seen. It's really, really wonderful. You can tell we're very biased. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did you guys go? <coughs> what group? Rhodes Scholar. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A particular one. There were 11, they were at that time, 11 trips. 11 trips to Cuba, and we picked the people to people where we would get we would get off a bus and go in their home and meet the people and talk to them. And those that did not speak English, our guide, our guy from Havana would interpret. So we had long conversations with college age men and women, with elderly, with those who were um, uh, artists, dancers, Musicians, I mean, we, it was wonderful. Somebody had their hand up. Yeah, I, I just have a comment. I think it's, it's really good because you mentioned the special period in Cuba. I'm uh, an acquaintance of Megan Quinn Bachman, formerly of Yellow Springs. Right. She made the film about uh, community solutions, how Cuba survived the oil. So I, I still think it's gone quiet because of all the mega fracking and lots of drilling, but we're probably, in, in this lifetime or the next lifetime, the second law of thermodynamics is probably going to catch up with our crazy, crazy consumerism, and we'll probably enter our special period. I think you're getting that way. Yeah. Yes, and I, I just want to say that um, Judy and I just talked about the possibility of showing that film. It's called uh, The Community Solutions Made. How many people have seen that? And I, I'm like ready to see it again. So I don't know. So we're thinking of maybe August 2nd. But it, it, it's not in stone, too. It's in writing. But you need to have Megan and the people who went there. Yes. Here. So that date. But yeah. So that's, that's who we'll get, right. Megan. She's still around. <laughs> yeah, she yeah. Got yeah. Okay, we're going to go Oh, one more. Marianne. Um, I just want to say that uh, Ann Taylor and I and a group of Antioch faculty were in Cuba during the special period in uh, 94 when we were there. We had the opportunity to visit high school, schools, uh, kindergartens, hospital, hospital uh, talk with members of the government. Just the one woman who was very high, I'm not forgive her. Part of the status exactly, but anyway, it's really informative. Um, we were urged, if we could, to take penicillin there because the Cubans had a difficult time, you know, getting the drugs they needed. And I remember that Jimmy Reaver and I spent a day wandering around and buying penicillin in various um, 
uh, gun stores in a town in southern New Mexico. And we also had the flood in New Mexico. Right, you had to go to the second country before you got in. Yeah. Yeah. And we also right. visited this uh, aid center that you mentioned, which is a non-flight. It was a very impressive center, as far as I can tell. And we, and we were able to you know, talk with people, those who could speak Spanish, I can't speak Spanish. But it was it was it didn't seem like a small place where they were, you know, imprisoned or anything. It wasn't that. Yeah. There was maybe questionable they were having them in their own enclave, but this was what they could do. Yeah. There was a there was a list in here when we when we signed up they sent us a list of could you please bring yeah. and it was stuff they couldn't get. And so we went down to you know CBS and Kroger's and wherever and got as much as we could and filled our, our suitcases for them. What did you take? Huh? What did you take? Uh, uh, Band-Aids, bandages, splints, um, flashlights, wipes, sanitary wipes, sanitary napkins, yeah. sanitary wipes. Yeah, right, all that. Uh, okay. Art supplies. Art supplies, yeah. Okay. So why, why don't the Europeans supply that? I mean, well, on any right. tour, on any tour, they would ask people to bring stuff. Yeah, yeah, not just. You know. I mean, it's the, they asked. The, it would have been if they were coming from Europe on Road Scholar. They would ask them to bring this. Yeah, but it wasn't like why is it a commercial thing from Europe instead of from the U.S. Because the Americans would embark them if they traded with Cuba. Right. The same thing they're doing yeah. now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can I just say one more thing? One of the things we did that was very interesting was met a collective of women who, in fact, had become builders and had built housing. And they'd also been built a, a preschool, which we were able to visit. So there were amazing, wonderful things going on. And she like whatever we were here in the States. Thank you, Mary Ann. I want to go back. I want to live there. Jane Dolores. And this is a, a song that's it's not specific to Cuba, but it's specific to uh, kind of all Latin America and Spanish people. And um, the internet says that it was invented sometime in the 16th century. Was a real guy? Stand is willing and able. There'll be non alcohol mojitos for you. And right around the corner. You ready? Here we go. Here's the introduction.
both hands. Face our Ready? is spirit of this fellowship and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. Gives me more pleasure than the sea. 